My name is Brandon Jewell. I'm with the CT Foundation. Uh, and what we have today is a presentation about dairy done right with Clover Sonoma. Uh, their representative, Adrian Spohr, who is uh, the marketing director, is here to give us a little bit of a presentation and an inside look about how dairy uh, does their how they how they do dairy done right, right? Exactly what the title is, um, but how they do it in a sustainable manner, how they um, you know, care for their animals and all of that. And so I'd like to introduce Adrian. Adrian, thank you so much for being here today. I appreciate it. And I'd like to also say welcome to Ms. Fernandez's ag class. Thank you for all the students that are here with us today. Um, we are also streaming live on YouTube right now. So for all the students that are watching live right now, I'm gonna ask that you keep your cameras and your microphones turned off. We will have a Q&A section at the end. In that case, you can turn your camera on and show yourself and ask a question live. Otherwise, during the presentation, if you have a question that you wanna ask, feel free to just ask it in the chat and either Adrian and I will address that question when we get a chance. Um, and same goes for those of you who are on YouTube, feel free to use the chat function there to ask a question. I'll be monitoring that and then we'll get to that when we can. Um, so Adrian, I think now is a good time. I'm just going to hand it right over to you and ask you to, to start your, your wonderful presentation here. Hi guys. Good morning. Thank you for jumping on. Um, the, you know, my role at Clover, I'm the director of marketing. I've been with Clover for about almost five years now. And I would just add that if you have any questions about, you know, having a career at Clover or having a career in marketing, um, I'm also happy to answer those questions. And with that, we'll jump into the presentation. I'm going to start us off with a video about our company, just so that you can get an introduction to who we are. My grandfather, uh, Gene, he was that classic quintessential World War II generation that survived the war, received the Silver Star, uh, didn't want to talk about it, but came home and was thrilled to start a life, thrilled to get married, have children. The only thing he wanted to do was start a family and start a country over again. And he wanted to coach football in the worst way, but because of his bilingual skills, he was recruited by the Petaluma Cooperative Creamery to call in the different dairies because he spoke Italian. He was subsequently groomed to run the co-op. He became general manager there. And the largest fire in Petaluma's history burned down the co-op bottling plant, and Gene asked the board of directors, all dairy families, if he could buy the Clover brand name. They agreed, he did, and Clover, as we know, was founded by him in 1977. dad did in the 90s. He recognized that, you know, dairy, such as it was when Gene started it, had to evolve, had to change, had to be more responsive to what customers expected. It really started with RBGH. And there was a synthetic hormone that was introduced to the dairy industry that gave dairy farmers the ability to synthetically increase milk production. Well, we went out, we secured our own relationships with family farms to where we knew with certainty we could get a milk supply without the hormone. We one by one started kind of going down that list and we became the first and only dairy that the American Humane Association, the oldest animal welfare organization in the country, endorsed for animal welfare standards on dairy cows. All 
all of us at Clover, uh, not just myself, take um, a lot of what Gene instilled in us in terms of the culture, the values of the company. He uh, was simplistic in his values, his ideals, and I think all of us somehow culturally get that from mentors in the business. You know, our mission always has been elevating dairy, making it better from the cow's perspective, from the lamb's perspective, and hopefully always front and center our consumer's perspective. That's our mission, elevating dairy. A hundred years is a milestone, um, but it's one that I think hopefully in the long history of Clover is a small milestone. So that was an introduction to our brand and you know given that you guys are studying ag i think you know one thing to think about and one area where clover has been able to sort of break away from the rest of the industry is you know with a lot of agricultural products they become commodities and the price pressure on them um, becomes extremely heavy so a lot of conventional milk companies focused on just becoming really, really cheap. And in the last five years, a lot of those companies have gone bankrupt or gone out of business. You know, Borden Dairy was one of the first dairies in the United States. They went out of business. Um, Dean's Dairy Pure recently went bankrupt. And so it's, for us, it's been really important to stay ahead of the curve. And you heard Marcus talk about it. You know, it's been all about making decisions that might not be, you know, the most financially lucrative or easy at the time, but they've helped us stay ahead of the rest of the industry. And he touched on, you know, saying no to RBST. Clover was literally the first company to do that. Um, you know, we have really high quality standards. And then we were one of the first to convert to organic milk. And at the time, everybody thought that was completely crazy. And then in 2000, we got American Humane Certified. So all of our dairies are American Humane Certified. And then in 2016, we just got B Corp Certified, which I'll talk a little bit about um, in a couple of slides. As a company, this is kind of the marketing slide. Um, but you know, when we're out there selling our milk to other companies, there's um, or to our customers, there's sort of four things that you know, if somebody were in an elevator with us and we had a question was why buy clover, it's about the locale. So, you know, where we're located. I know you guys are, you know, in this area as well. It's a beautiful area for cows. They do really well in a certain temperature band. They don't like a lot of heat. And so the ones that live out, you know, in Marin and Sonoma County sort of have this perfect lifestyle of pasture and um, pretty temperate climate. We talked about, you know, American humane. So like I said, all of our dairies are American humane. And then for us, it's been important to partner with family farms. So um, right now we have about 30 family farms that we work with largely from Marin and Sonoma counties. Um, and it's been important to us as, you know, a third generation family owned company to support third generation, fourth generation, fifth generation dairy families. This is a quick map of where dairies are. Um, like I said, you know, a majority of them are in and around sort of Marin and Sonoma counties. And, you know, it's been able to keep our milk fresher and enable it to taste better. And so a lot of people will say you know, there's this like clover difference. They try clover milk versus something else and they, you know, can taste that freshness. And one other piece that I touched on is our quality standards. So, you know, this kind of gets into the, the science, less exciting side of things for some, but at the end of the day, um, we pay our dairies more because we ask them to adhere to certain standards. And the most important one um, or ones are those around bacteria count, coliform count, and somatic cell. I won't go into great detail, but basically, you know, the government regulations allow you to have quite a bit of bacteria and coliform count and somatic cell in the milk that you process. And for us, we've set a standard. If you look at bacteria, for example, you know, we 
take in milk from our dairies every single day, twice a day. And so every time that milk comes into our plant, we test it and the maximum parts per million are 7,500. So if milk comes to our plant and is above that, we reject that milk. And you know what that translates into, like bacteria is just, it's a measure of cleanliness. It's a measure of how clean the cows are kept, how clean the equipment is on the farm um, and that whole process. And so we're able to like numerically define um, and monitor, you know, the quality of our milk by testing these three things. The other one, somatic cell is, is a measure of herd health. So we can know, you know, if the cows are stressed on a given farm, that, that number will start to spike. And we work with the farmer to make sure that, you know, the cows stay happy. So that number is well within range. I want to talk a little bit about our farms. Like I said, you know, we work with family farms. Our average herd size is about 400 cows. It's not uncommon um, for other brands. So for example, Tillamook, they have farms that are about 20,000 head herd. Um, I believe they have two of those that produce a majority of their milk. And then they have a couple of farms that look like ours. And so it's been a huge point of pride for us to be able to allow these farms to continue. Um, you know, in Sonoma County, we used to have over 500 dairy farms and that number has declined now to under a hundred. So, you know, it's important to be able to have local milk and we, we want to support these family farms. And with that, I will introduce you to the Nick and Amber but Key Dairy up in Sevastopol. I'm a fifth generation dairyman. I can remember back to my grandpa milking and then my dad and now me. Well, most of the cows are pretty friendly. Well, they all are. They'll just come up in the field and bump you in the back and just say, hey. <laughs> I was raised on a dairy farm and how to treat a cow gently, respectfully. And I know every one of these cows, 155 of them, I'm around them every day from day one. Don't use anything but my voice to move them around. Guess I'm a cow whisperer. <laughs> <laughs> we want to progress and we want to stay with the market and what's going to keep us here. But I want good wholesome food for my family and I want to know that we're producing that. Our quality milk starts with having happy and healthy cows out on pasture, not being confined, plenty of room to lay, which leads to better product for the consumer and a higher premium for us for keeping up that quality milk. My four boys here, they follow me around pretty much every day. My oldest, Nicholas, he'll feed calves, scrape the barn, wash the barn, move hay, stuff like that. And there's Lane, <laughs> who likes to goof off a little bit. Always wants to drive a four-wheeler around, usually. <laughs> And Mason, he likes to come out and work a little bit. They're still a little young, but they're getting there. And Brody, he's just the entertaining one. <laughs> Makes you laugh. Because they're growing up on a dairy, I think whatever they do, they're gonna do really well at, because they have a really hard work ethic. I would hope that they would want to take over the dairy, but I want them to do whatever makes them happy. But of course, you know, this is what we love. This is where we want to be and this is where we want to stay. It's a good way to live. And, you know, the, um, the Bucky's talked to a, a little bit about the American Humane Certification. You know, this for us has been probably the, you know, one of the biggest differences between us and a lot of the competition. And, you know, I'm sure you all sort of have seen it, you know, humane treatment of animals is becoming 
more and more um, important to people. I mean, I think it's always been important in the back of people's minds, but now when, you know, you're looking at food products, there's a very deliberate search for products that you know are coming from humanely treated cows. When you look at eggs, a lot of egg cartons will have a humane certification or some of some sort. And, you know, sometimes people will say, well, the logo is great, you know, but what, what does that actually mean? And so we're trying now to educate people about what is American Humane Certified actually mean? So on the left side, this is some of the communication we put on the carton. And what I would say is, you know, a lot of what you do when you're in marketing is figuring out how to teach people about your brand and your company and who you are. And the biggest challenge is that everybody is incredibly distracted, right? We've all got, you know, all sorts of video calls we're dealing with now, you know, a lot of things that are happening in the outside world. And there's just a lot of information constantly coming to us. And so finding ways to distill information into like digestible pieces like this is a lot of what my job is. And with American Humane, you know, we focused on five key points that we have a zero tolerance policy of animal abuse. It ensures a safe environment for each animal. There's extensive employee training with documentation behind it. Uh, we have a herd health plan overseen oh, by- the window, it's fucking cold. Uh, there's a herd health plan overseen by a veterinarian and nutritionist and then annual farm audits. And so there are a bunch of other components of the certification, but those are the ones that we've focused on. And, you know, a lot of what we're trying to help people understand right now is having an organic certification doesn't mean it's humane. I think a lot of folks assume that organic means the best treatment across everything, right? It's the, the best feed because it's not, doesn't have pesticides or herbicides on it but there really isn't a humane component to the organic certification. And so we're working this year on, you know, getting people to look for both rather than just assuming organic is sufficient. And with that, I want to introduce you to one of our other dairies. My family's been doing this for almost 130 years now out on the Point Reyes Peninsula. That's a long time. We're out here in very beautiful country, and it's pretty cool. There's no neighbors for miles. Huge number of acres per cow. Let's face it, this is a great place if you're a cow to cruise around the hills here. It, it really, really is. The stress is not good for us, and it's not good for cows. And to keep stress off of them, you're going to keep the cow healthier. Very seldom does it even get into 70s, really, so that's perfect for cow weather. We never sprayed herbicides because we're in the National Park Service. Uh, so we were pretty close to organic anyway, so we decided to jump in with both feet. We converted the whole herd over in 2006, and we've been producing organic milk ever since. Makes you feel like a responsible farmer. Um, so that's Bob McClure. He's actually, I was uh, talking about it earlier. He actually is out in the Point Reyes seashore. So like you said, I mean, the cows are right next to the coast and they're extremely happy. And then another thing, you know, I talked about a lot of what we're trying to do as an agriculture company is educate people on what's happening on farm. And, you know, I don't know to what extent you guys have sort of, you know, delved into, you know, dairy farms, but there's a lot of things that happen on farm that help reduce emissions um, because methane emissions are a, a major sticking point for dairy in general. So we've been working really hard to try to educate people about things that aren't terribly sexy, but are, you know, very real and functional technologies that help us to reduce emissions like separators um, or how our dairies, you know, have their own ecosystem where they're taking, you know, the manure from the cows and they're actually fertilizing the corn that they grow to feed the cows um, on a number of our farms. I'll touch quickly on B Corp because um, I do want to get to the sustainability piece and give you guys a chance for some questions. But essentially, um, B Corp is a certification that evolved to combat greenwashing, right? A lot of companies came out and said, isn't it great that we donate $20,000 to this local park, 
but then at the same time, they're sourcing palm oil from, you know, countries or companies that are tearing down the rainforest and destroying habitat and, you know, just generally not operating in a good way in a lot of different areas, but they focus on this charitable giving. And so P Corp evolved to look at your entire company and make sure that you're, you're being a good steward across the board. So, you know, some of the things that we talk about with B Corp is just this notion of having a responsibility to the planet, being transparent, like sharing our data, like, do we pay our employees a living wage? You know, how do we source from local suppliers, that sort of thing. So we're really proud of this. Um, it's a tough certification to get. And it also means, you know, we are a great company in a lot of different ways. We also give back a ton of money. And I'm sure at some point you've seen Clover in the community. Um, you know, it's always been a part of this company to give back quite a bit to the community. And this was from 2018. We gave back over $775,000. Last but not least, I do want to touch on product sustainability. So, you know, we live in an interesting world where products get invented for convenience that are incredibly wasteful, um, like straws and, you know, plastic caps. Um, on our milk cartons, we don't have plastic caps because the vast majority of the time they wind up in the landfill. Um, the other issue with them is that they encourage production of fossil fuel based plastics and a regular carton works perfectly fine. We all have opposable thumbs. And so, you know, we're working on helping people understand that we don't need this convenience because it leads to so much waste. And then on our cartons, we just recently launched a renewable carton. So on this carton, you know, when you look at a milk carton, it's made of corrugated paperboard, basically, um, the equivalent to what you'd get in an Amazon box, but it has this thin plastic liner on the inside and the outside that is a moisture barrier. So if you've ever had an Amazon box, you know, it's out in the rain, it completely starts to fall apart. So what we've done this year is, you know, about 85% of a carton is made from trees, which is what obviously makes the paperboard. Um, and then 15% of it is a polyethylene liner, like I was talking about. And in the past, that liner was sourced from fossil fuels. There are now technologies to be able to create that liner using sugarcane. And so through that process, it's about a 35% reduction in carbon emissions to use this carton versus another carton. So it costs us a bit more as a company. It's about two and a half pennies more per carton. And we run about 25 million cartons. And so, you know, it's a material impact, but it's something important that we recognize we need to do. And then um, last but not least, this is my last slide before we jump into Q&A. You know, we have a recycling system, but a lot of what happens is that folks don't clean their cartons or clean their packages. And so it doesn't matter if something's recyclable. If you've got a yogurt container that still has half the yogurt in it, it's never gonna get recycled. And um, so if we want to create a sustainable waste system, you know, we want to make sure that people understand what it takes to actually have something recycled. So we've been working really hard to educate people on um, how to properly recycle our packages. And with that, I will stop sharing and open it for Q&A. You know, I, I have a question, actually. I'll, I'll kick it off, um, if, if you don't mind. You had mentioned that organic does not mean humane, which I think is, is a really good distinction because a lot of people will look at organic and think that everything is, is all rosy with, with how everything is made. Um, but I also recognize that Clover themselves has regular milk on the shelves and then organic milk. And so I'm wondering what, what exactly does that mean? What is the difference between those two milks, even by Clover on the shelf? So for us, all of our milks are American Humane certified, regardless of whether they are conventional or organic. So then the difference for us between conventionally, conventional and organic largely revolves around the feed that's fed to the cows. Um, and so, you know, with organic, you have to feed 100% organic feed to the cows. Um, there's also a regulation in organic that cows 
do have to be on pasture at least 180 days a year. You know, what's interesting for us is a lot of our conventional dairies are also, you know, have their cows out on pasture just because of where they are. But I would say the largest difference is in the feed. Okay. And does that feed, having, having an organic feed mean that the, the, the cow is then healthier because of that? And then therefore the milk is better? I, I'm just curious. No, it's interesting. Um, you know, it, there are no tests to prove that the milk is healthier or different. The only thing that at least um, that has been sort of testable is the fact that organic cows, because of that 180 day mandate, will often have more um, omega threes in the milk because of the grass consumption. Mm -hmm. But it's generally a pretty narrow difference between the two in some ways that you know the cow is a, the great filtration system um, we talk about because you can't detect pesticides or herbicides in conventional milk right i mean the cow is consumed that and a lot of the feed you know through conventional is is obviously washed and processed there's still always going to be leftover herbicides and pesticides on any crop, frankly, um, that's conventionally treated, but you can't actually detect that in the milk itself. So, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I think now would be a good time to open it up to the class. Um, if they, if the class, anyone in the class has some questions, feel free to unmute and turn your Turn your uh, camera on and, and feel free to ask it of Adrian here. Giovanni, I see that you turned your camera on. Do you have a question? Uh, yeah, my question is how far does Clover, Clover Sonoma ship its products? Right now, just within the state of California. So the, the tough thing about our business is that the milk we produce typically has 21 days of shelf life. And then the retailer on the other side of that, they want a minimum of 14 days to be able to sell it. So we only have seven days to get it through our warehouse, which typically takes a day, you know, shipped down and then through another warehouse. So that's constrained us a little bit geographically. We're looking at expanding, but right now it's just California. It is interesting to think about how uh, we, in our local area, Clover is such a big company because totally. it's, we see it so prevalently on the shelves. But then if you were to go to the next state over, if you were to go to Nevada, they wouldn't even know what Clover Sonoma is, which is interesting. Right. Unless they move from this area. Yeah. 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 Um, uh, Seth, I see you have your camera on. Did you have a question? Uh, yeah, it's about the um, milk cartons. So besides the milk cartons, what other sustainable products are on the way at Clover Sonoma? So we're looking at um, PCR plastic gallons, um, which would just be, you know, 50% of the gallon plastic would be made from post-consumer recycled plastic, thereby reducing the demand for fossil fuels. The biggest challenge we have, like the holy grail would be to have compostable packaging and, you know, but if you step back and you think about what you're asking of a package, which is that it can survive being manufactured, it can survive going through our plant, being filled with milk, and there's moisture in the plant, then making it through our warehouse, making it onto a truck, getting to the store, all staying in good condition, and then for industrial composters, they need it to biodegrade within 90 days for that to be viable. So it's kind of like, okay, it's got to make it through this whole process, you know, which can take three, four or five weeks. And then the second we're done drinking and are consuming it, it can start to biodegrade. And so it's a really challenging chemistry um, question almost of like, how do you make a package that can do that? And, and that's the holy grail that we are working to see, like, what are the best options? But the other one is the, the post-consumer recycled gallon jug. Uh, let's see, uh, Max, do you have a question there? Yes, I do. I was wondering, besides being a farmer, 
what other careers can I go into in agriculture? There are a lot. So, um, you know, I would say, so just looking at our company, for example, you know, we obviously have our, our farmers. We also have a person who's our producer relations manager and her role is to be the liaison between Clover and our farms and to, you know, make sure they have what they need from us, vice versa. You could, you know, you could enter the corporate side of it. You could be, you know, managing the financials of it, right? And because milk pricing is based on commodities markets and they're constantly shifting. And so keeping track of that, there are roles within the government, you know, working with CDFA that you could go into. Um, another interesting one is working with the local RCDs um, who oversee the watersheds and work with a lot of the farms to either, you know, source grant funding from the government to be able to put in new equipment. Um, <clears throat> I've also, you know, heard of people that work with the Western Dairy Association, which is both kind of an insurer of dairy farms, but also a company that is a resource for the farms to um, look at new technologies to, to try to make their farms more profitable. So there's a lot, um, a lot of different things you can do with it. And it <clears throat> just sort of comes down to thinking about what is most interesting to you about agriculture um, and, and kind of following your, following that path and testing out different things, you know, to figure out what you like. And also something to consider too is the agriculture is, is the creation of say the milk or the, you know, the process of getting the milk directly from the cows, but then there's a whole manufacturing side too, right? Yeah. And, and that I know at Clover is pretty big and that you, there are several different types of manufacturing careers as well, right? Do you, would you mind going over maybe what some of those look like, Adrian? Totally, yeah. I mean, those are more like obviously within the plant. And so, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's reflecting on like, do I wanna be somebody who's focused really on the farm and the things that are coming out of the farm? Or maybe do I have a science, you know, sort of mindset and look at careers in like quality assurance, for example. So we have a team that's doing the testing of the milk that comes into the facility and just making sure that quality is good across the board. We also have people, um, we kind of have a, a handful of general roles. So receivers are people that, you know, test the milk when it first comes in. We have bottlers who run the bottling lines. And we also have people who are experts in pasteurization. And so they specifically oversee that part of the process. And then obviously we have people that work in the warehouse that, you know, are helping to organize the, the pallets and the shipments that are coming in from the plant and then as well as going out to customers. That's a lot. There's a lot of different things, yeah. My suggestion is, you know, in your career, Try different things, you know, keep broad in your horizon, but think about the things that are, you know, are you somebody who really likes to be outside and can't stand sitting in a desk all day? Like my boyfriend's an electrician. He looks at my job and thinks I'm crazy. Um, you know, and so maybe if you're somebody that likes to be out and engaging with people, it's more like, all right, I want to work, you know, with farms and, and help them improve their business or, you know, I'm a, I'm a really methodical person and, and numbers and testing and sort of the science path makes more sense. So maybe I look at, you know, quality or um, working with universities on testing new feeds for dairy cows. So, you know, just kind of thinking about who you are and what you like as well. Um, I'm going to jump in with another question that I have. You know, we showed some videos of the dairy farms and it seems very traditional and, and a lot of it, you know, that we saw that family aspect to it. But I know that agriculture today has some technology that wasn't used say 10 or 20 years ago. Um, and I'm wondering if you have a knowledge of what kind of unique technology that we might actually see on a farm now, like drones or GPS technology to track cows or something like that. 
Now, one of the ones I'm familiar with that none of our dairies have adopted. Well, let me touch on first. One of our dairies um, has a digester that is about seven acres big. And that is helping to supply natural gas to a local natural gas company. And so that is in and of itself an incredible piece of technology. The other side of it that our farms haven't adopted yet just because of the cost are milking robots. Um, so robots that help milk the cows, right? Clean the cows udders before they come into the milking barn um, because it's, it is hard to find labor to do that, especially in our area where it's really expensive. And, you know, the robots are actually found to be, you know, more consistent, um, but they're about a half a million dollars. And so we haven't seen widespread adoption of that yet. Uh, I do know there are a couple of dairies who aren't in our network who have started to purchase those. Now, do we have any other questions from the students? Actually, questions? I do. Um, yes. Carl, I turn on my camera, but if I did, I would probably get kicked out. But do you guys have any like final piece of advice for people who might want to get into this career with like food and beverage manufacturing and agriculture and stuff? Yeah, I mean, I would say, you know, try to get experience, whether that's looking at internships, um, whether, you know, um, that is trying to, you know, internships are definitely the way to go. If you can obviously get your foot in the door, that's always the hardest part with anything. Um, but I think, you know, spending a little bit of time really just reflecting on yourself, what makes you happy and doing research on the careers that are available. Sometimes you can also poke around on LinkedIn and just sort of see what job titles are there. And I would also say, you know, um, looking at your college path and how that might lead into different careers, right? Because some college paths are more vocational and, and maybe you can get working sooner um, versus some that are more, you know, like a typical four year path. And then you're, you know, kind of taking it from there. But I would definitely say, you know, try to find opportunities to just get your foot in the door, whether that's an internship, even a volunteer opportunity, and um, to just start to put yourself out there. I'd also say it's, it's, it's worth saying that the, uh, oh, I'm hearing an echo here. Okay, good. Um, the Santa Rosa Junior College has an incredible agriculture program that includes a huge farm that has you know, yeah. a whole whole wine aspect. It's got uh, animals on the farm. They've got different crops. Um, you know, they they basically completely cover almost anything you can think of um, yeah. on the side of agriculture. And it's an incredible program. Definitely, if you're interested in just kind of look exploring agriculture, yeah. I would probably first and foremost for our local students look at the Santa Rosa Junior College. Yeah, hands-on experience is the best because then you are going to quickly wade through like, ooh, tried that, don't like that. Like, you know, let me try something else. A place that can really do that. I mean, Cal Poly is another one. San Luis Obispo that has an incredible program for that. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Yeah. Wonderful. I, we're, we're kind of running up on time. I will leave it to see if we have one more question, if we have one. Okay, I'm not seeing anybody show up. So um, thank you so much for, for all the students who joined us today. Um, but it, you know, especially you, you Adrian, for taking the time to, to really give us a, a really well done presentation and inside look at how Clover does sustainable agriculture. I think it was really eye-opening. Well, thank you. And, you know, any questions come up afterwards, everybody's, you know, had, a, had their coffee or something, uh, feel free to shoot them to your teacher, you know, can get them over to Brandon, get them over to me. I'm happy to answer any other questions. Absolutely. All right. Thank you all.
Happy Thank you day. all. Bye. Bye. Thank you.